Hey everyone. Hey, you are allowed to talk if you want to say hi. That's fine. The town halls are more in Folmer format than just a webinar. Okay, so let's give one more minute to get started. Oh, we see this. Paige. Hi, Paige. Alejandro. Alex. Yeah, okay, so let's kick it off. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so here we go again. So first of all, thanks everyone for attending this third town hall. Town hall is a more informal session where we share some specific topics around uh, FluentBet. Uh, we have covered, for example, from news around the version 3.1. Also, we covered how you can do metrics and processing, uh, metrics processing collect in collection with FluentBet. And this one is an, about another topic that people have been asking about. It's like, hey, I don't understand how multi-trading works in FluentBet. And yes, we were generating some content and we found that, hey, this topic is really interesting for some people. It will be good to have it as a reference to let you know how this works in, in internals. As I said, this format is pretty informal. Uh, we will have a few Q&A session at the end, but please uh, put your qu questions on the chat, on the Zoom chat, or also in our Slack channel, so our team can uh, work on them and we make sure to address those. Okay, so let's kick it off. Um, uh, as we always do at the beginning of each town hall session, we would like to get your feedback from users. So we will take no more than four minutes just to fill up some information. Adriana is putting now on the chat a link to this document. So I would like to ask you please to log into it. But first, let me share it. I think that if I don't share it, you won't be able to do anything with it. So it's a pretty open document. So just click on it and start filling the information and yeah, no more than four minutes. We want to get your feedback from now and this is totally, totally anonymous if you want to add your name and your email because you want to have a side conversation with us that is open to. There is no, there's no problems. Okay, so the first question, just I'm going to, to read to the folks here is, have you participated before in Fluentbit Town Halls? Yes, no. If so, any recommendation? Oh, nice, we're getting Spanish messages this time. Uh, what improvements or new features would you like to see in FluentBet? This is pretty much based on your own use case. As you know, everybody has different backends, different sorts of data. And even if you are new on this and you're struggling with documentation, it's fair to say I would like to get better documentation or, you know, better getting started guides. Uh, the other one is about what improvements or features you would like to see in FluentBet. Uh, for us, this will give us as a guide to put stuff on the roadmap because also people file GitHub issues, but we have, we have like 300 between bugs and inherited requests. But also, it is good to know for people who are attending these sessions, understand hey, what you are interested in or what do you like to see. Uh, the next one is like, hey, feedback for us, anything you would like to add. This is pretty flexible, pretty open. And if you have questions that we can also, you can have it here at the end of the document. So we will make sure to make time uh, at the end to talk about this. Okay, so we have two minutes left. Please just go with it. Um, if also, if you have, and this is uh, quite common, if you have any contribution like a PR, a pull request that we have not been able to, to take a look at it and you, you want our help, to prioritize it, yeah, this is a good time too for that. Not to do it live, but uh, for us to add it to our backlog um, for the next week. Okay, and we are doing these Toho sessions every every two weeks. And at some point, if you consider that, hey, we should do it weekly, I don't know, that might be a good idea, maybe not. And I will share more information also on how you can get involved in this town hall. Now I'm the one, you know, proposing the topics, but would like to see also that the community can get involved in the town halls where you can share any topic around uh, Fluentbit that you would like to share. Very scoped to one thing, and we will help you out to to manage all the logistics to for you to present on this event. Okay, so the time is up. I appreciate. Uh, please keep writing if you want. This document will be open during this session, so make sure to just write down everything that is pending from there. 
Uh, as a reminder, FluentD and FluentBait are both graduated projects from the CNCF. That means that we have been around for a while and we are fully production great. And as you can see in the landscape, we are together with Prometheus, Jagger, and shortly, and I think that maybe this year also OpenTelemetry is going to graduate, so we will be at the same level. And we have yeah other projects around too. As I always said, FluentBit and FluentD, they are an open ecosystem. And when I said with open, we try to play well and integrate with others. We would like to provide a unique experience where users does not face this vendor locking, and actually you will be able to create any type of telemetry pipeline without hassle. And when you think about FluentBit, and this is always for, for people who's new to this, we aim to integrate, as I said, any type of sources of data and be able to connect this to multiple destination plus providing processing capabilities uh, in the middle. And FluentBit runs on most of architectures, um, ARM x86, uh, we run on Mac OS, on Windows, on Linux, uh, BSD, uh, we have a lot of ton of embedded use cases, uh, and also now uh, the team from IBM is doing some work to have FluentBit running on S390X, which is another type of Unix operating system. And these town hall sessions, uh, we have a, a public repository in GitHub where we are hosting all the information about the town halls. Pretty much what we have there, it's uh, when we do a demo, the demo config files, uh, we will have the reference um, to the YouTube recorded session. So we will make sure to be up updating this project repository so you can uh, contribute to it. And in any case, uh, oops. If you would like to, if you found any issue or you would like to propose something to the town halls, hey, let's use the open source way, just file an issue. And hey, you might be the first one because we have not created any issue yet. So please feel free to raise your hand. And this will, this is our primary point of contact. And there you have the, you know, the, the QR code stuff. And today we're here because we're going to talk about multi-threading, uh, what it means and what is the value for FluentBit users. Maybe when you use FluentBit, sometimes it's running behind the scenes or you're deploying a Kubernetes cluster in GKE, in Google services, and yeah, the log agent is working. There is Google Ops agent, FluentBit is running behind the scenes, and same similar thing happens on the AWS side. And I would like to give you also some historical context uh, of how FluentBit used to work in the past, right? Uh, the capacities that they have and how do we evolve the project over time? First of all, FluentBit has been designed with three concepts in mind since nine years ago. High performance, low resource usage, and have a pluggable architecture. That means that you can connect and extend its functionality in many ways as possible. Um, Side story, as I said many times, FluentBit was originally decided for embedded Linux, but then we pivot to the container world. And yeah, since we got all this as design and architecture specific, specific stuff for optimal performance, low resource usage, it ended up being a really good fit, you know, for high computing workloads like today, right? We run this on financial institutions, cloud providers rely on FluentBit, almost um, anybody who needs to collect, process, and deliver information. And as of today, we keep the same concept, keep it as a mod lightweight as possible and try to have to, to deliver the best experience for the users. And internally, to, we take advantage of many things like uh, we have a full event-driven mechanism, the full event-driven, and we do a lot of asynchronous uh, IO operations. And we work with files, we work with, uh, with sockets, with timers, everything that relates to I.O. is fully asynchronous. And as a context, as of the year 2020, FluentBit used to run in a single thread, right? It doesn't support multi-threading. And at that time, it was capable to support or process around 10,000 events per second. I'm talking about four years ago. And this was almost pretty good for everybody until uh, you know, cloud providers and all companies were saying, hey, now we, have, we need to process not 10, but 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 100,000, right? And that was pushing us in also to improve the design in the, the architecture 
and find ways to solve this problem that was happening on every single company, which is the problem was not Fluent Bit. The problem was like everybody was generating every year 20% more data. And somebody needs to handle that, and that is Fluent Bit. Internally, um, I'm going to give you a, a very high level overview of the, well, of the internals of Fluent Bit as of Fluent Bit uh, 1.7. That's a very old version. And I would like you to think that Fluent Bit is just like a main pipeline, right? And internally, it has one thread. Um, well, you know, one thread means it's just one process in Linux threads and, and, and processes are pretty much the same. Just there's a little dif uh, difference on what resources are shared. But basically, the main thread or the main process was able to have input plugins collecting data, having a main engine that also provides filtering capabilities and also provided a way to send this information out to the destination, which could be a, a backend service or a database that you would like to ingest the, the data. Right? Now, in one thread, uh, it was working pretty fine because we have a full asynchronous mechanism. We got all these asynchronous IO primitives. And maybe the next slide will give you more details about. So think about this. In the old version, we got one thread. We have one main event loop that is the central point that is synchronizing what to do at what time and when, right? So we have different input plugins that were collecting information or reading data from some place. Then this, this get ingested through an internal API, an internal API making sure to apply filtering to those events that were being registered by the input plugins, then the buffering happened and the scheduler try to decide when it's time to flush that information. And if it's something goes wrong when trying to send the data out, the retries happen. This is a very high level stuff, but this is the design with one thread and one just main event loop. And in the output side, what we call output plugins, output plugins always does pretty much the same. They receive the data that has been collected. They decode the events because internally we encode the event in what we call a message pack format, right? It formats the data for the format that has been expected by the remote endpoint. For example, if you want to send the data to Google Stack Driver, they expect the logs to be in a specific JSON format. If you're going to send the data to Splunk, yeah, Splunk also expects JSON, but in a different schema. So every plugin just take care of, take the data that is a message pack, encode it to the right format, and try to deliver. And if something goes wrong, you know, the internally we will have the retry, the scheduler, we will handle that. And now this is something that has been working for many, many years. But this is one of the challenges. People want to do a lot of filtering. And we have found use cases and big companies that are running 20 to 30 filters. And as much filters you were adding one after each other, the more contention we were adding to that thread. Like input plugins were adding information, but you have more filters. Yeah, this part here in the middle is going to add a lot of latency, right? It's like, oh, I need to compute this. I need to generate new buffers with all the modification, the data, and so on. So think about this. You are getting more data being ingested over time. Now you have more filters. And of course, that sounds like a recipe for a bottlenecks, right? You can scale until a certain point. So uh, this is what happened many years ago, right? So our old architecture was working at a certain level. But do it to the use cases that people need to solve. Yeah, it was not scaling uh, as much as we wanted. And if we look forward now to, to this year, well, this what we're going to talk about multi-threading now is not something that happened this year. It started to happen gradually after 2020, right? We start with output plugins, input plugins, and testing different uh, ways to improve performance. Now, this stuff looks a bit more, um, more complex, right? And it scale more. So now the data pipeline, uh, you can think now that we, we keep having the, um, like the three major components. Maybe I'm going to go back some slides where we have data collection on the left, 
we have main processing or the main engine in the middle, and as a third step, you know, delivering the information. And the architecture doesn't has not changed on this, right? But what has changed is how do we split uh, the logic about the task that needs to be done in the pipeline. This is kind of the concept of divide and conquer, right? Just take one problem, divide in little steps, or very similar to the Unix philosophy, and make sure that we can scale. Right now, our computers does not have one simple C CPU core, right? You can have many CPU core, and each one has threads, and it, you can scale as much as you want. So, and the way that this works, we have a typo here, I just found it. Sorry about that. It's like we have the main engine, and that's it, thread number one. And what it does is to run the scheduler and also run filtering and buffering and all of the things that we saw before. But the biggest difference that in Fluent Bit V3, right, input plugins can optionally, and I said optionally, run in a separate thread, right? And as well, output plugins can run in separate threads. And there's a couple of concepts I'm going to explain here. Uh, why do we need to run input plugins in a separate thread? Uh, we found that um, we're talking to users and analyzing their configurations, it's like they were always following the same pattern. They were collecting data and doing some processing for that input plugin or that data that was collected from that place. Right? And when they were sending the data out, there was the need also to do some extra filtering. And that's a mostly advanced uh, use case. But I also would like to introduce another concept that happens while we got Fluent Bit V3. As you can see, we have this uh, purple box or pink box that it says processing. I don't know if you have been around Fluent Bit for a while, but we have filters which runs in the main thread, like here. Right? that allows you to process the data but runs in the main thread. And now we introduce the concept of processors. And processors run right after the input plugin. And if the input plugin is running in a separate thread, that processing will happen in a separate thread. You are no longer processing here in the main thread, just in the separate thread. But of course, you need to enable this in the configuration. Okay, so input plugins can optionally run in a separate thread. By default, uh, they are not running in separate thread. And I think there are two plugins by default that are doing it. That they are metrics collector that like Prometheus not exporter, the Prometheus, uh, sorry, process metrics exporter that collects the processes and the metrics from the system. Those run by default in a separate thread. But you can force any plugin that you have to run in a separate thread, and I will show you how um, in a minute. OK, so when you put plugins separately, collect and process the information, they share the information with the main thread, which makes sure that collected optionally, you can do filtering here. But I would say, hey, if you are doing threading, you don't need to filter here, right? It's times better if you do processing in that separate thread, because my guess is that that thread might be running in a separate uh, CPU core, and that will, able, will provide you better scalability. OK, and now we're going to talk about the output. Output plugins, um, as I said, they receive the information from the main thread, they decode the data, they format, and they deliver. Right? And we introduce what we call the concept of a uh, workers. So, which is different from how input plugins run. An input plugin can run in a separate thread while output plugins can spawn many workers. Okay, and what are workers? Workers is just a thread, right? That what it does is to have the capability to do processing again, if needed. And also the flush callback, we call the flush callback uh, the function, the internal function that is in charge to deliver the information to for the code format and deliver this information to another bucket. Okay, so each worker, 
So each flush callback is running in a separate worker. So you can set, please run Splunk uh, with two workers. And this will mimic two workers. And just run Lucky, Lucky with one worker. Now, the typical question is, OK, if this is running a separate thread, how many flush callbacks can it run at the same time? Just one? No. That thread is running, and that thread is cap capable to, I don't know, run hundreds of flush callbacks in a, in a high concurrency mode. So each worker can give you, can handle more than one flush uh, requirement. And normally, if you have like two workers, three workers, I don't know, you can, you can scale and have a lot of processing because pretty much all of this is really IO intensive. Most of this is just you format the data once and then you just open a, a socket connection or TLS handshake, all of that, and start sending the data. And since that data is very tight on how the kernel operates, because what we do is like, we format the data, we take the data, and we, we invoke a system call and tell the kernel, please flush this information. And at that point, that flush callback is going to suspend, suspend because it runs under a coroutine, and it's not going to get back to that execution point until the kernel says something about it. Hey, I deliver everything, I need to deliver more, or there was a problem, okay? So having two to, two to four workers in the output side, it's pretty fine. Of course, if you have more workers and you're running a high concurrency, you have a lot of um, data being ingested, yeah, Fluentbit might be able to saturate your endpoint. Meaning like, yeah, because we're going to open as much connection possible, we want to optimize for performance. But there are ways to optimize for that. Uh, no optimize, I mean, there's a way to control the data flow to that. We're not going to cover that because today we're just purely focusing on the architecture of multi-threading. So again, and the recap here, every input plugin can optionally run a separate thread. Output plugins can run zero workers or more workers, right? If you have zero workers, it means that the output plugin is, will run together with the main event loop. When we have input plugins in a thread, and we have output plugins uh, in a separate thread, each thread is running its own version of the event loop. Each one is running a, like a small, tiny version of the event loop to handle all the events as if it were running in the main uh, thread. And basically we have, and this is a kind of more high level, thread one, where we can do filter, buffering, scale, whatever twice, Thread two is where data collection is happening, reading the data, encoding the events, and optionally doing processing. It's going through the main thread, and then this is going to the output plugin. That optionally can run in a separate thread. Today, output plugins, most of them run in a separate thread. And there are special plugins that uh, set a number of wor workers by default, which is different than one. For example, Splunk, if I'm not wrong, is two. Open telemetry, uh, Oppo plugin runs in two threads because we know that those plugins are always configured for um, or are expected to run for high intensive workloads. Okay, so multi threading and configuration, or maybe um, Adriana and Austin, I don't know if they have some question as of now before moving forward. Um, let me check really quickly the document. I think that for now, we don't have questions. Got it. Yes, no questions. Awesome. Well, I hope that um, I'm able to explain well what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so, okay. So, other concepts. So, input plugins from a configuration perspective to make it run in a separate thread you need to enable what is called the threaded mode, which is a Boolean option. If you're using classic configuration mode, you will say threaded on or threaded through. And if you're using the YAML version, it will be the same, on, through, everything that means is positive. In the output plugins, which is different, you need to specify what is the number of workers that you will need, want to define to span multiple workers. 
And I'm going to switch to my terminal right now to explain this. Okay, can you uh, let me make it bigger? Okay, in my configuration here, or maybe let's, let me use uh, let me use Visual Code. Okay, this is the YAML configuration. I have defined what we call a service section, and we define the flash interval, the lock level, just information, and in my pipeline, I have two main components. Very simple. The input, which is the dummy plugin, what dummy does is to print a dummy message. It's like a one message per second. You can configure the interval and all of that. And in the output, it will just print that message take that message and print it to the standard output interface and a JSON lines format. So if we do Fluembit, um, Fluembit.yaml, Fluembit will start and you will see that the dummy message is being printed to the standard output interface. Now, what is really interesting here is like if we start inspecting what's going on. I'm going to use uh, the command called ps3 which inspects processes and threads, and I'm passing the PID of Fluembit, which this will match this value from here, but we will do auto discovery, and it will tell me how many threads Fluembit is using. There's one thread that is called the logger, that is the one to receive all the login messages and handle that, write it to a file, or write it to a standard output interface. We have one that is called FLB pipeline, which is a main thread, and then we have other that is called out std out. So std out plugin is running in one worker by default. Now, uh, when inspecting this, there is a challenge. Sadly, uh, the Linux interface does not allow to set thread names longer than 60, 16 characters. So that means that even if we have a very long name for a very useful troubleshooting purposes, we won't be able to get that. Okay, but std out is running in one worker. What about now if I say this? Remember that I said that input plugins to run in a separate thread, you need to enable the threaded mode, and we're going to make it through. Now, look at the change when I run this. The fluent bit processing and the output will be the same, but if we inspect now, uh, what is happening in the Fluentbit process, we will find that this new thread is there. In dummy, it was not there before. This is what we had before. Okay? So in dummy, is running now in a separate thread. STD out is working in one worker by default. But we can do this. Workers. Uh, okay, four. For workers. And if I run flow and bit and inspect again what's going on, you will see that now STD out it's running in four workers. Now this is a very basic way to see it, and of course, a, how many workers you will have in production pretty much depends of your own needs, right? But one worker is cap capable to handle a lot with two four workers. We have use cases where a, you can handle. 100,000 messages per second. So it's, it's very capable to work, process a lot of events with a low resource usage. Okay, and that, that's how you enable, um, you know, a input plugin running in threaded mode and an output plugin in with workers. Now, I have not tested this, but I just came up with the idea, I hope it's not a bad idea. I, I would try to do this. I don't know if it will work, I don't remember. If, Doing zero means that everything will run as the old version of Fluentbit. It seems like it should be backward compatible. So it will work, but we need to inspect what's going on here. Yeah, here we go. As you can see, I set worker zero. And now everything is running in the main thread. Same as we got here. Pretty much um, we got doing, hey, where is my window? Ah, it's here. We are, with that configuration, we just mimic this. 
We have one input plugin in the main thread running with the output plugin as part of the same thread. And also, if this is running in the main thread, also we can enable threaded mode and say threaded through and let that work separately. So the input plugin will run in a separate thread in dummy while std out as part of the main thread. Okay, when you work, when you're playing with uh, workers, threads, and all of that, is because you want to achieve uh, more scalability in your environment, right? If by default it works fine, hey, don't fix it, right? This is like a, one of the first engineering rules. If it works, does not fix it. And yeah, and we were here. We explained this concept, and yeah. Again, the configuration has to be threaded enabled and set the number of uh, workers. So now I would like to give some time to have a Q&A, right? I know that this concept can be so really confusing, so really happy to answer any questions that you might have. So we have some questions here and in the document, maybe I can read it for you. We have the first one. Is there a performance test to measure how much threaded inputs plugins can bust the maximum log volume that pipeline can handle? First question. Yeah. Is there a performance test to measure how much threaded input plan can boost the maximum log volume can handle? Um okay, performance test is always tricky. Before to answer that, uh, I think I need to need to give um a good advice. When people test performance, right? There, usually, you have another tool generating the data to see how Fluentbit or any other service is behaving. We found that normally people tend to run those performance test tools together in the same machine where Fluentbit is running. And that tool, since it tries to test performance, writes a lot of information to disk, generating very high I.O. and almost consuming all the resources of the machine. And when you try to test Fluentbit, yeah, Fluentbit is trying to work with the resources that the system provides. And at that time, there are a few ones. So make sure that when you run any performance test um, with any type of tool, your tool does not saturate the system. That is really, really uh, important. Let me be this bigger. Okay, and is there a performance test to measure how much the input plane can boost the maximum log volume that can handle? Okay, I think that in most of cases, I say in most, not all of them, if you are not running a threaded mode for the input plugin, should be fine unless you have filtering. If you are doing filtering, and you're doing this filtering kind of in the old way here in the middle, like this problem is highlighted here, this is generating latency for you, okay? But I think two steps to fix that. The first one is to move to processors. Filters can work as processors, okay? So you deploy this filter as a processor and also you make your that plugin to run in a separate thread. That will give you a, the best performance. How to measure properly, uh, it depends on case by case in terms of what do you want to test, daily files, do you want to test an HTTP input to send data over the network. Um, we don't have a, a specific tool for that. Well, we used to have one that was very, uh, for very unique cases, let me check the front test, uh, bench. So we have other benchmark tools, but not that one. Operator, charts, test suite, infra CI to hold channel. Now oh, we have a lot of projects. Let me check. Fluent bit perf. Oh, we have not touched this code in four years. But this is really cool because um 
this have a couple of tools. I'm going to share the link on Zoom chat. Maybe it's time to revisit this project and give it some love. What it basically does, uh, FluEmbed spawns other FluEmbed and start generating data for you, but also that initial process is monitoring how FluEmbed is behaving. So you can say, okay, when generating like a million records, this is how much is writing every second, this is the CPU usage, this is the amount of um, CPU time spent on user mode versus system mode, which is kernel mode, and memory usage. So this is really good because you can configure it in different ways to see how FluentBit behaves and how much resources are being used. Uh, because everybody measures hey, events per second, right? But I always say that it's not the same to say, oh, my car is faster than you yours if you don't measure how much gasoline or gas you need to achieve that speed right so always a always to, to good to measure okay how much cpu okay we are writing i don't know, hundred thousand messages per second okay but now tell me about cpu tell me about memory usage and where we are spending time and this tool is really good for that i we wrote this many years ago and found that there are many people using it today for this test. So I would suggest one of these to just take a look how this performs and behave. And if it doesn't work, please open an issue. Uh, yeah, we need to give it some love to this project that has been there for, for a long time. Okay, uh, how much resources does threaded plugins increase? I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I yeah. asked the first question. So, and so, so generally speaking, we believe uh, threaded input plugins can improve the log volume the pipeline can handle. I mean, yeah, the, the, you know, for example, uh, Kubernetes, a containerized environment. But if we, uh, I'm asking if we have done such, you know, load test to measure just, you know, I mean, there are many input uh parameters for load testing but generally speaking there should be is that it, there is a you know uh performance improvement right yes and there's a performance improvement because the moment that you run this in a separate thread you remove the contention here in the middle okay okay because yeah it's like it's not the same have one person running versus two. One run before you, pass you the information, and you run again, right? So you're running in parallel. In different CPU cores, you are optimizing. So yes, even if you're not doing filtering, but if you're in Kubernetes, you are running uh, the Kubernetes filter, which is talking to the API server, trying to read the cache of information that it has, like labels, annotations, package, repackage, everything. It's quite a complex uh, process. Uh, if you're not doing threading mode, pretty much uh, you're doing this, right? Now, if you enable threading in the tail plugin and you attach Kubernetes filter as a processor, yes, you are splitting the logic, you know, and you are removing the saturation that normally happens at this level in the middle. So, yes, okay. it, will, it will be faster. It will okay, be faster because testing... you're removing contention. Okay, uh, and yeah, my understanding is if, you know, threaded input plugins, you know, uh, for some, you know, use cases, it has bigger, you know, performance improvement on than other scenarios, right? A bigger, no. We have not seen downsides, honestly. Okay, okay. Yeah, but the always the rule is if it works, don't fix it. If you want to go for more, Yes, move to threaded plugins, move the filter as processors so you can desaturate this stuff. Now, if you just move so, uh, as, a threaded, as a threaded mode and you don't move the filters, you might not notice a difference. But if you move the filters, yeah, you will notice that. OK, thank you. Yeah. How much resources does threaded in plugins increase? Uh, a thread needs 
maybe 500 kilobytes, one, two megabytes maximum of stack size on Linux. So it's, it's not a big deal. It's, you, you won't use more resources for that because uh, a thread is just a separate space and a separate running context space inside the operating system which share resources with the parent thread, basically. So it's pretty lightweight. It's not a, it's not a big deal in terms of, oh, now we'll use double memory. No, it's, it's not like that. What is the best number of threaded plugins? Okay. To answer this, I will this. My question will be for you is like, how many filters you need? And if each plugin is doing filtering and you have a complex routing between tag and matches, hey, just move that processors and run it as a separate thread. And you will be pretty fine. But all depends on how much processing you need. I will say that. So I have seen a lot of use cases where people now is moving all these filters as processors and they're working pretty fine. We cover processors in town hall number two, which uh, we did with metrics. So also for we did it for logs. So also I will encourage you guys to to watch that because we cover some examples. But uh, we are here. Okay. Okay. So let me see if I have log to metrics. For example, this is another configuration. This is a log to metrics. I don't want to mix. Uh, this is like a a dummy plugin that generates this message. And we are applying a processor. And this processor converts the log to a metric. But the concept is like, yeah, this is like running a filter. I just wanted to show this the structure on how the, this is um, composed. So we have the input. So we have the input and the processor attached to the input. And now if you do this, even better, because all of this block will run in a separate thread, which if we don't have that, right? Here we have filters, log to metric, but that runs in the main thread or all together adding contention. So, okay, so Fluentbit have a limit to protect CPU usage? Oh no, Fluentbit is like all you can eat. Right, he just sit there and he said, I will try to go as much as possible. Today is like, I don't know, Friday in Pizza Hut, I will try to eat everything because I want to go faster. And the way to uh, slow down things, there are many techniques with membuff limit if you're not using file system storage. There's a way to say, I don't want to create too many connections in the output side. Um, and there are, if you're running containers, that's a way to isolate and restrict resources to the process that is running. I don't know if we have more questions besides this. Yeah, I have one last question. Uh, oh, um, so for the multi-threading model, what is the scheduling model? Uh, does, uh, you know, the threads created for input plugins and for the workers, workers for the other plugin, are those uh, plugins scheduled by the main thread or just, you know, always done by the kernel thread scheduling. Okay, so for example, input, I don't know if I have this information here, let me see. I always have some extra slides uh, from the architecture. Da, 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 da. In the old architecture, it's just a single thread, you know, event loop. So the main thread takes care of oh, you know, all the events. Yeah, okay, so Maybe your question is how the communication happens. Right, yeah. Okay. So the, the Fluent Bit, it starts, and then it says, okay, I have all these plugins. I'm going to start them. And each plugin has its own, its, its own world, right? They know how to collect and pass the information to Fluent Bit. Okay. Internally, if uh, the plugins are not aware, input plugins are not aware about threading. 
they don't know anything. They don't know they're running a separate thread. And the way that it works is because we have a single uh, API function that detects if a plugin is running in a separate thread, yes or no. If it's no, it just passes the memory pointer with the buffer directly to the function that needs to do filtering and buffering. But if it's running a separate thread, that function will detect that and will use what we call a ring buffer. We have a ring buffer uh, between the two threads. So if every input thread that is running a separate thread has a ring buffer. So it just adds information to the ring buffer. In the main while, the main event loop is reading that information from the other endpoint and the queue in those events. But it's only passing the reference. It's not copying the full data. It's saying, OK, this is my pointer. Here you go. It received the pointer, takes the data, it buffers, and the input plugin just forget about it And because buffering happens. So we use a ring buffer for that communication. And to communicate the main event loop to the output plugin, if it's running a separate thread, uh, in main, the main thread um, has an event loop running. And the, op the output thread is, has its own event loop. But the output thread has some channels through pipes. I don't remember if they have pipes or socket pairs. right? They are connected and registered from the main event loop. So the main event loop can tell the output plugin, send, just send a 64-bytes uh, a message, hey, this, is, this chunk, which how do we group information, is ready to go. And the event loop from the thread will take it, will process it, and deliver the final result. It was like, it's OK, I need a retry, or I need anything else. But all the logistic of coordination when receiving data, buffering, and instructing when to deliver happens in the, event, in the, in the main thread. The output plugin thread just care about to receive the, 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 the pointer from the information, try to format, try to deliver. And if it fails, it just say, hey, I need a retry or this failed. And then the main thread will decide what to do. If you just give up or formally do a retry after X number of seconds. Thank you. Great. I've OK. Sure. You, would you like me to type it, or should I, can I just keep talking? Oh, you can talk, and then at the end, if you want to type it on the document, we'll it would be great. OK, yeah. cool. Uh, this was really exciting to learn about. I'm curious, what situations would you think you should scale instances of FluentBit versus configuring this multi-threading? Like, when would you just want to add another instance and scale FluentBit horizontally? When you don't want that FluentBit becomes your single point of failure. Mm, OK. OK, but looking like, uh, OK, let's draw something. OK, and let me check what we were talking about here. I'm showing you the source of everything. OK. Um, Imagine this use case here. Oops. So we have, for example, this one. So are you aware about a was page or who was who was who was talking? So I didn't see the yes. name. Yes, page. Okay, page. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to use this. If you have, for example, FluentBit running as an aggregator, an aggregator means like it's a central point where you are receiving data from other agents. It could be FluentBit or could be other remotely. So these guys are talking here. So this is what we call a forwarder or something that sits on the edge where the data collection is happening. And this is what we call an aggregator. This kind of a different type of deployment models. And of course, if this crashes, right, these Fluentbit agents, we will 
keep retrying and trying to talk once it gets alive. Now, your question is, hey, when should I consider to have a more uh, resilient design of architecture if something goes wrong here? Yes, yes. Yeah, usually this is what people do. Oops. Well, let me simplify this. Uh, group selection. People do this and they add what we call a balancer. It could be based on DNS, it could be based on, I don't know, multiple things. And this balancer says, I'm going to talk to this one and then I'm going to talk to this one. So you have some failover mechanism. So this is when if you need to have a high resilience environment, this is when you will consider to deploy multiple fluent bits. Because at some point, uh, yeah, each process is limited by the resources given by the operating system, CPU, memory, access to disk, and uh, everything else, right? So yeah. Now, if we have Kubernetes, yeah, you might look for some pattern around an operator that how to handle this. Uh, for us. And so we have some commercial products uh, from Chronosphere, Observe IQ, and or Cribble. They have their own tool, not based on Fluembed, but their, their own way to create these scalable pipelines. That if you want crashes, it will to be able to create it and how to balance and recreate. I don't know if that answered uh, the, the main question. Yes, that makes sense. I was thinking about the same pattern for the open telemetry collector, and I didn't know if it was common for folks to do this with fluent bit as well. So multi-threading is for performance of the pipelines and load balancing across fluent bit instances is more for resiliency. Is that what I heard? Yes. Okay. Now there's a, if we talk about also with the collector, um, for example, we talk about, not, not about tracing because I know the collector use case are about our chain sampling and all of that stuff for tracing. What is important also is to understand what is the capacity of my aggregator or collector that is running, right? So Fluembit is times lightweight that the collector. So for something a, that sometimes you have people measure, I need to process this amount of event per second. Most of companies come up with that. I need 80,000 messages per second. Okay, what is the config? How I can achieve that? Once they can achieve that, maybe with one single agent or multiple ones, after that, they usually come, okay, what will be my failover mechanism? How am I going to solve if something crashes? How to avoid to lose data? And that's kind of a second step and different story for, for production environments. But yeah, the patterns are pretty much uh, the same that hasn't existed even from the flu in the era 11 years ago. Like having forwarders, aggregators, and you will sometimes, people say, I would like to have this here because I don't want that the agents talk directly to the output backends because that means that you need to share credentials or you, you, you might, you might expose something that you don't want for, and for security reason, it's not good. Yeah, but answering your main question, yes, a one fluent bit agent can handle thousand messages, hundred thousand messages per second. If you're going to scale or have this, it's because you have want to have more reliability. If something goes wrong, if some of, some of them crashes, of the I don't know, something can everything goes wrong in this in this world with network storage uh, DNS. So you want to make sure to have something that will prevent you to from losing data. Yeah, okay, that's the question. Thanks for that. Okay, so I don't know if you have more questions or anybody from the audience. I think we have just one last question. Um, in the Zoom chat says events per second, is it for multi-threading or not? Yes, yes. One of the most expensive uh, tasks, at least inside Fluentbit, and I would say any agent, is when you are converting data from a very optimized version like message pack to what is expecting your backend like JSON. So 
formatting to JSON is really, really expensive. The most expensive stuff has been not doing connection, not TLS, or anything that I was talking here is about formatting data. Formatting and computing JSON is really expensive. And yeah, it gets a little better with protobuf or other binary protocols, but anyways, the conversion has its, a, its own cost. So the story is like working, we were working with Amazon and Google many years ago. We were still working with them, but we were working on how to scale up even more. And that's how we come up with this design of multi-threading. And yeah, Google validated this, that they were achieving like 140,000 messages per second in their own setup for their own use case. So this is, has been battle tested for these cloud providers like in a very insane ways. So yes, if you want to shift that number, you need multi-threading. Thank you. Um, Eduardo, could you share just for a second the last slide? Oh, sure, thank you. This one? Yes, thank you very much. I think this will be kind of our last slide here. And thank you, Eduardo, and thank you everyone for joining. Happy to see you all here. Um, so before we finish the session, I'm Adriana, part of the Flow and Bit community here. And I want to share some resources that will be useful for you and some QR codes for you to scan as well. So we have the first one, which is the Manning book. If you haven't um, get or download it yet, this is a good opportunity. Um, the second one, we have every two weeks, our meetups. This is kind of a small group session. Um, it, it's led by a primary maintainer. Great chance to ask questions as well, check PR codes um, and roadmaps request. And our third one, and coming soon, it's our webinar, Parsing 102 with Flow Embed. It will be hosted by our Flow Embed um, maintainer, uh, Jose Lecaros. Registrations are open. I will send you all this information later as well. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, I think this was my a small slot promotion. Yeah, thanks, Adriana and Austin for setting up this and you folks for joining. So yeah, we're having the town halls every every two or three weeks. We're covering some one specific topic. If there's anything that you would like to be covered, please open a GitHub issue on the town hall repository that I shared at the beginning. And yeah, that will be all from my side. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Happy weekend.